Hello and welcome to our first webinar of 2021. Welcome. We made it past 2020. Congratulations to everybody on the line. I see lots of familiar names and, and friends on the line and colleagues. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over um, two housekeeping items. One, we're going to keep all of the audio muted for the entire audience. So if you have any questions, please type them into the webinar controls. Before we even get to that point, let's make sure you guys can even hear me. So if you can hear me, raise your hand in the webinar controls. All right, here we go. Let's see who's on. Oh, Bill, Brian, David, Molly, Kyle. Look at this. Just a bunch of winners we got here. Hey, Tom. Hey, Selena. All right, y'all can lower your hands. Um, all right. So you can hear me. You know where the, the question section is in the webinar controls. Um, before I introduce our guests, I just want to let everybody know that over the last three years, I've been hosting these webinars and had amazing, amazing guests on the line like Tyler Tatum with Three Phase SC. And this actually is my very last webinar that I'll be hosting. I'm, I'm moving on to another role with SC Launch or SCRA rather, moving on um, out of the SC Launch um, umbrella of um, SCRA and moving on to become the project manager of the Palmetto Tech Bridge. Um, please contact me or I will contact all of y'all with that information on what I'll be doing in the future, still wearing the SCRA hat, but moving on. So on the line with us as well is the, the lady that will be taking over for me, part of our marketing team, Kelsey Davis. So y'all will meet her at our next webinar. So without any further ado, I'm sorry to take your time. Um, I want to introduce Tyler Tatum with Rephase SC. He is the foremost expert in SBIR and STTR opportunities in, in the nation, right? So you'll learn so much more about, um, you know, finding out about these opportunities, learning what to do with them, and how to apply for them. Tyler, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Sounds great, and thanks for the introduction, uh, Julie. <clears throat> um, uh, and thanks for everyone joining today. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, do my best to impart some knowledge to you and also to help you understand more about the three-phase program, which is uh, South Carolina's effort to improve both the quantity and the quality of proposals across the state. And uh, you know, let you know more about how we're here to help. So um, I think, Julie, you're going to have questions. You're going to collect questions, and we were going to start, I think, stop midway through maybe and see if anyone has questions, if I remember. Yes, Is absolutely. I forgot to mention that part. Absolutely. So we'll pause about halfway through. We'll open up the um, the question box for questions. I will ask, I will read the questions out loud, and Tyler will answer them. But please do not hesitate okay. to get the questions started um, and get the queue of questions going, and then Tyler can answer them when we get to that halfway point. Thank you. Sounds great. So we'll jump right in. Um, <clears throat> so Three Phase is a unique resource of SC Commerce uh, focused on, like I said, improving the quantity and quality of proposals across the state. It is uh, a free program. Um, there's really two parts of it. One is is educational webinars like this, you know, conversations, everything we can do to educate the public on this unique uh, resource. And the second part is is where we really get to do the good work, which is we actually do one-on-one -on -one proposal support. Um, you know, everything from you know significantly reducing the time you have to spend messing around with the agency websites and registrations and helping with all that uh, all the way to um, um, you know actually building your story and assessing your story and assessing the credibility of your your technical content and whatnot so we're we're all hands on deck support resource for SBR STTR and uh, 
if you're in, you know, at the end of this webinar or anytime you're interested, reach out to us uh, and or you can go to the threephasefc.com website and hit apply now and fill out an application and we will be uh, ready to help. So <clears throat> um, without further ado, I'll jump into the the real reason you're here, which is, you know, learning about SBRS TTR funding. I'm going to do a really quick overview of the program itself um, and then get more into you know some examples of companies that have been funded and why and and my goal in this is <clears throat> is more to help you understand what we're seeing is important in terms of your messaging and and putting together a good proposal um, in this particular webinar than you know going through all the, the basics of SBR funding. Uh, we can always do that offline. Like I said, give us a call anytime. So um, so the basics. Um, <clears throat> the program itself is a $2.5 billion program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's per year. And so, and it's increasing, you know, yearly. It's basically a small portion of the overall dollars that are spent on um, federal research and development that is allocated to the program. And um, there's 11 different agencies that fund the program. Um, and so it's it's a fairly large amount of money they're giving out every year, um, which is the good news. Uh, it's also equity-free funding. So, you know, if you use it right, it allows you to, you know, in an equity, you know, without giving up equity, get the money you need to um, do the research and development to build a minimum viable product and validate it and test it and all that good stuff so that you can either out, attract outside investment from investors and or, you know, I always, you know, also put out there, you know, there are companies that are able to get go straight to customers after a phase one and or a phase two, um, which is even better. Um, but either way, you want to think of the SBRS TCR program as a bridge to get you from where you are to someone else's money, whether that's investors or customers. Um, and, uh, you know, if if you think of it that way, you will be more successful with with SBRS TTR. Um, there's two versions of the program. There's what's called the SBIR program, and there's also what's called the STTR program. The primary difference, most of the money, is in the SBIR program. Um, however. That does not mean your chances of getting funding from SBIR are greater than STTR. A lot of it depends on your situation. Uh, the biggest difference is that in an SBIR, you can subaward a third of the grant to you know other players, including a large business or an academic institution. And STTR is a partnership between an, a research institution and the small business. The small business still leads the grant, but the small uh, the the research partner is required to do at least thirty percent of the work. The small business has to do at least forty, and then you have thirty percent that's up for grabs in between. Um, the other time in S so STTRs can be advantageous if you have to, especially in phase one, give up a lot more money to to get some initial validation or research done uh, because you don't have the facilities as a small business is starting out to do the work yourself or you can't get access to those. Um, another reason to look at STTR is that the PI can actually, except for the National Science Foundation, the PI can actually be um, employed by the research institution and does not have to be uh, fifty-one percent employed by the S the the small business um, that can be advantageous, especially with groups like NIH, National Institute of Health, that are very picky about resumes. Um, one thing to remember with the, all of this is that you're dealing with government objectives. 
Um, and, and, you know, that can be, especially as a, a, you know, someone with an entrepreneurial mindset can become painful because there's a lot of hoops to jump through. They'll ask for the same thing three times. They'll force you to fill out a lot of paperwork. Um, those are the downsides of dealing with the government. Um, you have to track your finances a certain way. You have to be potentially audible, but you know, in, in lieu of that, you are not giving up your equity, um, which is the good news. But, um, and, and my rule of thumb and my lesson that I put out there along these lines is that, um, if you think of the person on the other side that you're dealing with, pretty much everyone you deal with will have no control over what they're asking for, but they do have control over whether you provide the right information or not. So uh, when you run into, you know, you know, this, this, you know, frustration with the government, if you just realize they need to check a box and that if you help them check that box and don't argue about whether the box needs to be checked or not and just give them, you know, enough so that they can check that box, you'll move on and you'll get the money and everything will be fine. So, um, but anyway, it's just important to think about when you go after SBR, STTR, because it is government funding. Um, eligibility, you have to be a for-profit small business concern. This is an important issue that comes up sometimes. We do have nonprofits and we have to tell them that we can't you know, work with them. Uh, less than 500 employees, um, it's likely most of the people on the phone are not going to be an issue there. Um, if you're VC funded, this can get a little tricky because it, that includes all of the affiliates that are tied to, you know, the VC if you're more than 51% owned by the venture capital. If you are in that category, talk to us and we can research the rules for you in your specific case. Um, independently owned and operated primarily in the U.S. Um, again, this sometimes comes up um, along with the 51% owned and controlled by one or more individuals that are U.S. citizens. So um, just something to keep in mind if you have foreign nationals involved in your company. Um, like I said, for, for the SBIR program, the PI, uh, this is one of the requirements must be 51% employed by the small business. Um, <clears throat> that's important to remember because now the catch there or the, the good news is that you do not have to pay the PI 51% of their income under the grant, but they can't get you know, like basically a majority of their income elsewhere um, and and still, you know, qualify as the PI. That's that's the catch. So um, I just had a um, uh, uh, one company I was, I've been working with. They got a response from the National Science Foundation. It looks like they're in, in the running to get funding. Um, and the uh, PI is actually getting paid zero dollars, but is a hundred percent with the company because it's an active company and, you know, uh, they get paid out of, um, basically the profits of the company. And so there are situations like that where you don't have to be paid, but you do have to commit that you're 51% employed by the small business. And, and most of the time you have to commit at least 15% of your time to the project. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. Um, with an STTR, except for the National Science Foundation, which always requires the PI be part of the small business, the PI can also be employed by the research institution. I've had this be used and come up several times because there are times like with the National Institute of Health where, you know, these, the resumes and the credentials are just, you're not going to get those through the small business, especially in a phase one. So you need to piggyback on, you know, the academic inventor, for example. Um, 
Another big one is you, research must be performed in the U.S. Um, that can come up if you're looking to outsource overseas uh, your engineering work or your animal studies or uh, anything like that. They say, no, we want the money spent in the U.S. Um, so that's, again, I'm, I'm doing a super quick overview of the program just to get your head in the game. I want to dig into what companies are getting funded. Um, and so what I did and what I want, uh, I'll talk through is, you know, I have a few examples of companies that I'll go into some detail about that have actually been funded um, and, you know, the information is public about them getting funded. And what I'm going to highlight is what I believe, you know, and what I saw were the reasons that, that they did get funded and what was important. Um, the first one's a, a really good example. So this is a company called Pentavision. Um, they were funded recently um, or, you know, got their, their, their score back and were, you know, are in, they're actually in the progress of getting awarded, but they um, have a 3D imaging technology for cervical cancer. Um, now, one of the things we really worked with them on and we realized um, was missing. And so they had submitted once. We worked with them on their second submission and they actually scored a 10, which is unheard of. Um, very impressed by their, their scoring. They did a great job. But the, the key things we saw that were important to getting them there were originally, they were coming, kind of coming out the angle of saying, like, we got a cool, you know, 3D imaging technology, and you should really care about that because it's 3D. Um, they did not do, or, or in their, their proposal where they got a great score, what they really did um, to, to make the NIH get really excited about what they were doing is not necessarily, you know, hammer that is 3D, but hammer uh, and, and, and really highlight the impact that 3D imaging is going to provide for healthcare in general and, and how this is a game-changing technology. And this is something that when we work with companies, we see over and over again that they tend to fail to highlight as well as they could is the fact that, you know, every technology, there's kind of the initial, you know, what is it? And then there's the, why is this going to change the industry that it's going into? And so it's really important um, to think about those things and, and really try to identify, um, you know, how you're changing an industry based on your technology and how your customers are going to reap a substantial benefit from what you're providing. Um, so what does 3D imaging do? Well, you know, 3D imaging is not just a fancy version of 2D what it really enables that 2D imaging will never be able to do successfully is the, the um, <clears throat> creating a significantly deep set of metrics on the things that are showing up on the screen. Um, those metrics are things like color, you know, tissue color, volume, and shape. And volume and shape are really some of the the really substantial things that happen when you go to 3D imaging. Um, and, and if you think about it, like in terms of a lot of the work that's been done um, and, and, and what doctors and, and also things like AI processing need in order to do a good job of classifying, you know, what's cancer versus what's not, um, when it comes to 2D imaging, you're you're just getting a flat image, and all you have to go on is maybe the outline of the shape and the size of that shape. But when you start to add in the depth, you know, the volume and the shape and the structure of that lesion, for example, um, it's totally game changing in terms of what you can do with that information, uh, both visually as a doctor. 
and and also in terms of uh, you know future AI type processing opportunities. Um, these are really important things to you know again to think about when you're looking at your technology and how to build your story because um, you know again with this example um, without that leap of you know here's all the new information and new capabilities that this technology provides a lot of times what we see is that proposals go in and they don't get funded or they don't get scored that well or they're on the border um, even if the science and the rigor is there um, so so you know again in this example really looking at what is 3d you know what what's the leap forward that this new technology is enabling um, the other thing that and and this is partially tied to the the um not just 3d but their the way they built their imaging technology is that they built it in such a way that that it didn't require a doctor per se to use the device and capture the right imagery so again that that can be you know with an innovation that can be game changing if you're basically taking something that currently requires a you know, high priced personnel or, you know, a person that's heavily skilled in the art and your device now allows for, you know, uh, you know, a lower, um, you know, a person that's, that's uh, maybe not as well qualified to use it and create the same level of results, even if there's a doctor that eventually looks at those results, then that can be game changing um, in the medical world and and I'd say in a lot of situations out there um, it's always important to think about for example like in the medical world like patient flow um, and and I've seen this with this technology and also with other ones that I've worked with where um, patient flow is a huge issue in healthcare um, getting the data that you need for assessing a condition. Um, another scenario I worked with a while back was related to um, uh, uh, ocular imagery, OCT scanning. And, you know, in that case, it turned out that, you know, the big bottleneck in, in OCT scanning, um, and, and you think about this applies even to people with diabetes or things like that, was the device itself and this group was coming up with a handheld version um, and what that enabled was for um, even in the lobby they were saying if 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 I could buy 10 of these for the same price I could buy this one big machine I could go and just start scanning people even if I can't charge for them in the lobby and then figure out later what I can charge for but that relieves a huge bottleneck I have um, so anyway, those are important things to think about. Again, you know, what are you enabling? What are you changing when it comes to your technology in terms of things like patient flow or doctor's time? Um, in the medical world, and, and, you know, you can think about analogies in other industries, one of the big things I heard, I've heard too is if you add even seconds to the time it takes to address a patient, your technology can get thrown out, you know, just because of that. So the doctor's time in assessing a patient is so critical. You know, you can never do a good job. I mean, you you can always, you know, you can never do enough to, to uh, or you can, you should always consider that factor heavily. Um, if you're adding, doing anything to add to the doctor's time, you know, you got to have a really good value proposition to justify that. Um, so again, what does this enable in terms of value proposition? So there's kind of features or advantages. And then we also look deeply to say, what is the value? You know, what, what's the value you're delivering? And those are really two different things that are important to segregate in your mind. Um, you know, uh, in this case, you know, one of the value props is that you can, based on this, this richness of data, you can 
in a single visit, pre-screen someone and treat them on site if necessary. So the, the optics are good enough that you're basically, you know, you don't have to do a lot of the other, you know, first and second screening techniques you had to do before. Again, that's game changing because patients may not come back. Uh, they may be hard to track down. Um, there's a, a, a lot of reasons that if you can if you can enable treatment and assessment in one visit, um, that is a, a major value proposition in the medical world. Um, I've seen that with a lot of other technologies I've worked with, um, and and you know it's a reason, for example, with assays and assay development. If you can get your assay time down to 15 minutes, then the person goes sits in the lobby, they come back, they have the result, bam, you treat them there. Um, if it takes two hours, you're not going to keep them there, and that can be a, a, a major difference in, in the, the health impact of a technology. Um, reduce time for patient to diagnose. Um, again, we just talked about that, like, you know, the time it takes to assess a patient, you know, in this case, this technology would significantly reduce that. That can be a huge value proposition. Um, exponential increase in screen patients. So how many patients are currently not thoroughly screened or miss a second screen that now, based on this technology, they will get screened? Um, not only in, you know, uh, high-end medical centers, but think about across the world or other populations that they don't have the staff or they don't have the, the, the expertise in their office or in their facility. Um, and then exponential increase in data quality. So um, those are some of the value propositions for this particular technology. So I'm gonna move on to my second example. Um, so this is a National Science Foundation proposal. Um, National Science Foundation, so in it, National Institute of Health is very interested in, in advances in public health. So, you know, what is your impact and how are you going to justify that you're you're changing, you know, the public health world for the better? Um, if you can position it right, sometimes they will fund things that aren't quite as game changing as that 3D imagery. You know, it could be a new assay, it can be a new, you know, a surgical tool, et cetera. Um, but the big thing is how is it changing public health substantially? Um, NSF, on the other hand, wants to see game changing advances in technology um, and so it's important to realize that distinction they also want to really know that you've done a good job of assessing the customer uh, opportunity um, they, they really want to see a lot of focus on things like customer discovery and what you're able to find out from your customer discovery um, so you know NIH you could probably do a lot of things sometimes, like it's good to have letters of support, but you may be able to go out and, you know, just could do a good job of referencing what's going on in terms of the, the potency of the problem. NSF, you gotta have, you know, detailed information from talking to people. Um, so for this particular technology, it was a, um, a way to treat aneurysms or, or bleeding that's easy to use, cheaper, and safer. Um, so you can target it anywhere in the body. Um, you can even turn it on and off uh, based on, on, you know, some of the technological advantages. Um, and, and the bigger issue and the other thing that, for example, NSF wants to see, which is different from the National Institute of Health, they want to see that it's a platform technology that potentially solves a number of problems, not just, you know, singly focused, a single condition. So, again, in this, this case, the fact that you can target it all over the body, it can be turned on and off, it's cheaper and easier and safer, uh, it's, it's, um, fits into that platform technology uh realm so um 
the other thing that that you know the advantages and 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 what this group did a really good job of outlining was they even had quotes from their stakeholders and stakeholders in in healthcare you know you don't just have customers and in a lot of cases you have stakeholders but in healthcare it's really important to outline the different parts of the community even if they're not writing the check that are involved and in this case you know the hospital purchasing committee is one of the main buyers because they're doing the surgeries and they're responsible for acquiring the tools to get the surgery done um, or or the, get the treatment done. Uh, the insurers, they're always in the loop because they pay. Um, so you got to get their impressions if you're medical technology. Um, and then the physicians, of course, are implementing the technology. So if they think it's harder they think they think it's more complicated than they're going to um, challenge and, and make it hard for you to get your technology into the medical community. Um, so, so, you know, again, they did a really good job with this particular pro proposal of <clears throat> highlighting those stakeholders and understanding what their different needs are. Um, value proposition wise, um, they're less, you know, this, this technology for, you know, like I said, is less invasive. So it's easier on the patient. It's, it's not as, you know, painful or, um, scary or complicated for the patient. That can be an important one. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to add another example of a company that, that scored very well and actually got a direct to phase two on a technology and it was related to a catheter for um, breaking up kidney stones and letting them filter down into the bladder and out of the body. Um, we spent a lot of time with them and in that case, the current state of the art was a, a hard plastic tube that you pushed up into the body and when you you put it in there the 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 body like just cramped around this for 48 hours and it was typically very painful very stressful for the patient and and not a fun experience um until the body relaxed enough to let that device be be accepted and then eventually you had to pull it out well this company came up with a or a, a degradable, a biodegradable version of that same tube that was actually softer and, you know, allowed the body to, you know, curl around it better. Um, so, you know, initially it was more talking about the biodegradable aspect, um, but the big issue that really sold the NIH, we believe, on the value of the new technology was more the, the the fact that patients were so scared of this procedure due to the pain that the reduction in pain was a su substantial value proposition. So I'm just giving you an alternative example of less invasive. And, um, you know, we really spot, spent a lot of time thinking through that one because that, uh, um, uh, well, one of the other things I'll mention, especially in medical, and it's true with any industry, you know, is you've got to really ask yourself what is going to make the doctor or the customer or the engineer change what they're doing now. Um, and and it's easy to underestimate that, you know, the need to change. Um, people are highly resistant to change. And if you don't appreciate that fact, you're going to have a really hard time in the business world. Um, and so the reason I'm really highlighting some of these things is because in working with you all and what I want you all to impart from this presentation with is how do I sit down and really be honest about what's going to make a doctor or an engineer or, a, you know, another cust or a customer per se change from what they're doing right now, even if they're doing nothing. Um, so that's just you know, again, with, with that particular customer, when I talked about pain, we really sat down and said, okay, why are doctors going to use this versus what they know, what they trust, what they've done for 20, 30 years? Um, so again, important things to think about. Um, 
other value propositions, no rebleed, uh, better visu visualization. So they their solution could be visualized through ver various imagery techniques. Um, no preparation needed. Uh, I've seen this with a few groups lately that, you know, the current uh, solution requires you to mix stuff and add stuff and that process, even if it's 15 minutes, maybe it's an hour. In this case, it was an hour. Um, that that ready to use value proposition can be very important because again, it reduces the time per patient and, and it reduces the opportunity for errors um, and access parts of the body previously inaccessible. So um, I'm gonna talk through one other example. Um, well, this might be a good time, you know, we're at 1130. 35. Do you want to stop real quick and see if we have any questions, Julie? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, we've got two questions and one good comment that's come in that I'll let you um, address the comment as well. Okay. Starting with a company um, that does chatbot, te chatbot technology in the Charleston area. The question um, really is just about, um, do you know when they will update the application dates on the SBIR STTR website for 2021. So those are getting updated. It depends on the agency that you're interested in. The, the SBIR website, SBIR.gov, is not always the best place to look. Um, if you want to do a separate call, anyone on the phone, I'm happy to do that and talk through your your target agency and and you know what you're looking for there because the individual agencies post these on a on a regular interval on their individual sites so you know national science foundation for example has four solicitations per year that's their attempt to make it a continuous opportunity to solicit you know to, to put in proposals mm -hmm. um, but they require a project pitch a two and a half page project pitch be submitted before you submit a proposal um, other groups are your yearly, so we can quickly and easily, depending on the agency, let you know um, what we anticipate in terms of any timing on any of the agencies. Um, okay, you all thank often, you for that. Anyway, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. No, I was just going to say I'll, I'll make the connection and, and introduce the two of you guys over um, actually, I think there's somebody else on his team on here as well. So I'll introduce the three of y'all via email. Okay, great. Okay. And then the next question is, um, I believe it's slide eight, which you talk about eligibility. Could you go back to that slide yes. for just a second and specifically clarify sure. what you define as employed? Um, I, you know, I, and there's no other detail in here, but I'm assuming you know, like a lot of us are, you know, thinking about what is an employee, 1099 contractor, et cetera. So could you please specify yeah, so um, what you mean by employed? Yeah, so that's a good question. And um, the the bigger um, concern when it comes to this is that you don't want to get audited. and <clears throat> and And, you know, there are exceptions here that are, probably complicated and those if you are in lieu of getting an award you'd want to talk through with the agency and the program manager to make sure you're clear but in general what you don't want to happen is that you get audited and it comes out that you're getting you know a hundred thousand dollars from a day job and you're getting you know 20k from your small business and you're trying to argue that you're doing 51 percent work for the small business um, those things can get touchy and you know you can get into uh, all sorts of trouble you know in terms of like you know uh, defrauding the government or things like that so you want to be careful about and, and and that's probably the bigger concern is where else are you getting salary or money and is that going to count contradict the fact that you're saying you're 51% employed by the small business. Um, in terms of anyone who's listed on the grant itself 
and how they are paid through the grant. Um, it's it's really important to do that via W-2. Um, so if you're a contractor, you can get paid 1099. But again, you know uh, the 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 safe answer and and really the right way to do it is anyone who's a direct line item on a grant should be paid W-2. Um, none of this has to happen until the grant gets issued. So you can do whatever you want up until the time that the grant is actually in place and make the change at that time based on that money coming in. Um, so that's another important point. You don't, have, you don't have to figure all this out until you're actually funded. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Um, so a gentleman named Mark asked the question. Mark, um, thank you for your question. If you have any additional follow-up, please feel free to type it back into the webinar controls. Um, the last um, item that we have here is a comment um about uh, you know outside of the country versus inside of the country work and the comment is research on a sub award can be outside of the country if the organization is a sole source provider indirect costs usually limited are usually limited to 10 percent would you like to comment on that yeah so this is a very uh, we have found, you know, it's, it's a tough one to justify. Um, and, you know, there may be some scenarios where it's easy, you know, where you can get it justified. But the bottom line is they really want the money and, and the rules and regs on SBR say it, sh it needs to be spent in the U.S. Um, if it's something where you can't find the expertise or you know, you you absolutely the only place to get this service or this, you know, mold or this, uh, you know, what have you, is from an international company. Um, then, um, and 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 again, international companies can have U.S. subsidiaries, so there are ways to work around it there, if you know, if possible. But if international is the only place you can ever get the the particular thing you need then that's potentially justifiable you will if you you know to to be appropriate there you definitely need to highlight that in your budget justification and you know maybe even in your proposal so that you're not hiding anything and there's no you know kind of funny business going on behind the scenes that the government finds out about later um, you want to be upfront about it, but um, there are potentially situations where that applies, but it's going to be rare. Um, and I would highly discourage it unless you really know what you're doing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to you, but I'm also going to make one comment real quick. Looks like one of the attendees has um, technically raised his hand. Um, I'm not sure, okay. Dennis, if that is a question or if you, um, you know, just accidentally click the raise hand button. But if you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind just typing it into the webinar controls. Other than that, Tyler, I'm gonna hand it back to you um, for the remainder of the time. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna jump into, um, you know, keep moving through. Um, and, and this is just following up on all the, you know, everything we've been talking about so far, but, um, you know, the key question is, what are you enabling? What are you changing? How is the world gonna be a different place with your technology? Um, and, and you know, I'm gonna give another example, and this is a group that we worked with on a resubmission. They have, not, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, full disclosure, they have not been funded yet, but it, but it is one that we submitted, we got some feedback on, and we've had to shift our messaging. And I think we're getting to the point where we can, you know, but we're better articulating that particular question. Initially, they were um, proposing that, you know, they have a, a material that's very lifelike, it's reusable, it's remoldable, and they were going to build medical phantoms. Um, uh, and, 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 and they were basically going to provide a cheaper version. And they had put in there all these ideas that it's reusable, it's remoldable and stuff. 
But really when it came down to it, they said, you know, we're a cheaper cost option. And again, low cost and, and, and going with a low cost message alone is, is a double edged sword and often does not get you over the hurdle of being innovative. Um, the thing you really need to think about and what we really focused on in this particular situation is the fact that, you know, in this case, what low cost meant was not just the cost of the initial product, but the lifetime cost, the cost per procedure. So when a medical student went in and, and, and did a, you know, procedure on this device, the other devices tended to fail and maybe on the first procedure, maybe on the second, but, you know, definitely by say like the fourth or fifth, where this one you could use potentially indefinitely, um, even, if, you know, especially if you sent it back and got it remolded by the company, but it was self-healing and reusable. So when it came to the cost, when we looked at it instead of the cost of the device, but we looked at cost per procedure, you're going from say $800 on average per procedure down to $80. And, and, you know, in terms of value proposition and messaging, <clears throat> you know, that can be a huge difference. If I'm a medical student and I can, you know, the, the school can only afford for me to do one procedure on this device, and then I got to go work on real patients, that may help, but it doesn't help that much. You know, if I can do 10 procedures on this, you know, as similar device, and, 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 you know, 10 is the number you can in your proposal say creates proficiency. I mean, that's a game changer. So, um, you know, another aspect is you can train 10 more students. Um, and, and the more you train these people on, on a anthem versus a real person, and they had very good stat data saying that, you know, training on a phantom did equate to higher proficiency in a patient then you know that is game changing so again just another example of value and how you articulate that uh you know and you go in with just hey this is a lower cost on the front end it they don't like it as much but when you talk about this game changing nature you really have to think about that and make sure that comes across in your messaging um So, you know, again, going into what are your, I think we talked about all this, you know, new users and existing market, new markets, reduced time, cost reduction. Um, you know, again, we're happy to help you think through all this, but it's important that you really present that message well. Um, I'm going to do a couple quick slides. I want to leave some time for questions at the end, but on, on building teams and partners. Um, and, and and again, I just have two slides on this, but um, roll right into that. So <clears throat> it's very important when you're building your proposal to think about your team. Um, we have a lot of groups that are, you know, highly academic, very smart people, really know their technology, but they don't necessarily understand the business side of getting it to market. We have other teams who have a great concept, maybe even have a patent, um, have have done a lot of work on trying to figure out the market. But in terms of resume credentials, you know, they don't have, you know, the right engineering talent. They don't have the right technical talent. And so, you know, when they say they're going to go do experimentation, you know, the the reviewers tend to call their bluff on that and say. You got no credentials to show that you've ever done a, you know, you've ever outlined a scientific hypothesis. So it's important to think about those two sides and how you can build up your team. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, like I said, resumes, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, resumes can be very important in these proposals. So you need to think about, you know, especially in the health sector, but even in other sectors, how can you build up the credibility of your team in terms of people who are experts in the industry, have publications, are well versed in what you're doing? Um, and, and and so 
you know, it's, it's really good to be honest and ask yourself that question. Um, and, and think about who can you add to your team? Um, in terms of potential people to add on, they can be universities, they can be industry partners, they can be individuals <clears throat> who you consult with, um, they can be team members you pull on and pay them W-2. Um, but, you know, the sky's kind of the limit in terms of the the capabilities you can add to your team to build to that technical credibility. Um, and you don't necessarily even have to pay them sometimes. Uh, you can have them as board of advisors where they're just, a, they may just say, yes, throw my name in the hat. You know, uh, they may be consultants. You may pay them a few thousand bucks to assess or validate or, you know, assess your design, you know, your, your research design. So the, you know, the results are sound. There's all sorts of ways to include them. And, and, you know, the, the highest level is probably sub award where you're taking a chunk of the money and handing it off to them. But, um, it's just really important to, um, be honest about your technical credibility when you're building the proposal and how you can build up that technical credibility. Now, having said all that, you know, when we're working with companies, um, we are, are uh, very happy to jump in and even introduce, track down, create, you know, make those relationships happen. Um, and we have done that both on the industry side, the individual side, and the university side um, within South Carolina and beyond. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'll track down people at you know, Mayo Clinic or GE or whatever we have to do, um, you know, a lot of times to help build that team credibility. Um, but it's, you know, it's an important part of your proposal building. The other side of it is business. Um, how can you show um, some in phase one, but absolutely in phase two, you know, people on your team that have been there done that. So, you know, executives, uh, people on the marketing side, the sales side, um, it's important to think about people who can add to your team um, and, and you know, how they can help you in, in building up your grant proposal. Um, it could be executives in the industry, executives in related industries, and I say related as in, you know, if you're doing a, you know, a certain product, maybe they don't have direct experience on that particular, you know, your competitors, but they've done something that's highly related and they can guide you through all the hurdles of getting it manufactured and, you know, getting it through any sort of, um, you know, hurdles you're going to have to do in terms of contracting or manufacturing or, uh, regulatory or, you know, dealing with your competition or all those sort of things, sales channels. Um, you could also think about people on, on your team that could be potential partners or even client companies that could work with you in the early phases to make sure what you're building is something they can either help you get to market through channels to market or maybe they can help you validate or test your product. Um, so, and then the bottom section, how do they help? Um, you know, in the business case, a lot of these people will not get paid through the grant. It's the grant does not pay for sales and marketing help. It pays for technical expertise. Um, but you know, again, there are ways that you might be able to pay them through the grant as an advisor or, you know, a, a product expert or things like that, but just realize they don't have to get paid through the grant. Um, your board of advisors, I've mentioned this in the technical and in the business, you know, this is a loose term and, and it's, it's not board of directors, which is officially part of the company. It's kind of like an outside board that's helping you out. Um, you can build that up in all sorts of ways early on. You may just say, Hey, can I put, put your name in the hat? and people may be fine with that, but it is a great way to add to your team without having to, you know, bring cash out of pocket. So it's just a, a great tool when you're building the credibility of your team. 
letters of support, um, anyone you can get to, you know, partners, clients, you know, potential clients, uh, executives in the industry, experts, letters of support are always a way to add and, and, you know, um, add to the credibility of your proposal. Um, <clears throat> and then another thing to think about is maybe to a partner or a client company, you know, potential client company, would they say in their letter, hey, you know, when you get to the right point, we'll evaluate the product, we'll assess it, we'll look it over, we'll be a beta test site. All of those things significantly add to your business credibility because it shows that you have a path to market. Um, so that's pretty much what I hope to cover today. Um, a lot of information. I want to stop real quick and allow for questions at the end here. Um, but like I said, we can always have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with anyone who's interested. Thank you, Tyler. Great presentation. Um, just piggybacking on what you said on that last slide, I want to encourage anyone who is currently working with the um, SCRA team, whether it, it, you know, any of the programs that we manage at SCRA, um, number one, SCRA, your point of contact will always be willing to write a letter of support for you. Um, you know, we're, we'd like to see the title, you know, your project title or any other types of details that you have. But please lean on us to help you, um, help, you know, partner with you to get this done, writing letters of support, et cetera. In addition to that, after you have received your um, SDIR Phase 1 award, the, um, uh, there is a grant opportunity at SCRA that will match it up to $50,000. And we'll do that. We'll do two of those in a lifetime of a company. So two different SBIRs with two different um, project titles, we'll, we will match it up to $50,000. So that's another benefit. Um, so right now we've got the line open for questions. Um, you know, go ahead and start typing them in. Um, and, and we can, you know, we'll use the rest of our time for that. Right now there are no questions there. So first person with a question, guaranteed yours will be read. Here we go. I see something coming in. In the meantime, Tyler, what are you most excited about? What is the topic that you are most excited about for 2021? You just can't wait for someone to send you an email and say, hey, this is my idea or my business. Please help me find an SBIR for it. What is that golden topic that you are just excited to dive into? That's a good question. Um, and it's it's a tough one to answer just because we deal with such a wide swath of technologies, you know, from medical to materials to, um, <clears throat> you know, just across the board. I'd say that um, one way to answer that is is that I feel like we haven't gotten near as much um, activity for proposals for like the National Science Foundation, um, and and I'm excited to track down and find technologies that fit that c criteria of game changing, you know, industry changing technologies, and 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 to get some of those proposals into the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, that's probably, you know, there's a lot of great technologies out there that are, you know, have value, but, you know, that's one where it's always exciting to track down that, that technology that's, that's, you know, truly differentiated from the competition and, you know, the change in industry um and, and and to work with those groups on national science foundation so that's just what i'd say is is an exciting area great great thank you so um i have a funny feeling that no questions have come in because everybody is about to send you an email asking for a one-on-one -on -one phone call <laughs> sure so um, uh, to that, to i will say <laughs> yes i absolutely so Tyler works on a great team. I know that there are some members of your team on this call as well. And so thank you for all the work that y'all are doing and, and thank you for you know participating in this webinar. My last SC Launch and Learn 
been a great run. I appreciate you being my last guest, and um, and I look forward to working with you and everyone on the on the phone in the future. Great, sounds great. So, um, well, yeah, thank, thank you, you and, Tyler. Uh, and um, you know, as as we said, we're here to help. So just let us know. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and enjoy 2021. Get those SBIRs in. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Thank you.